In Jesus' name, amen. Every, uh, I'm not a frequent flyer, but I've had the opportunity to fly several times. I remember the first time I flew, I was in sixth grade and I was flying to Mexico. We flew out of O'Hare and the experience was wonderful. I mean, it was great, all these new things, right? Now, when I fly, I'm a little annoyed. They put the, they put the seats about this far apart, uh, maybe this far apart, I don't know. You're crammed in there like a pretzel. And what do they do before you, uh, before, before even taxiing out to the runway, you're sitting there, you've been sitting on the plane forever, they board the plane, you know, in stages, and, and you get in there, and, and you're sitting and sitting and sitting, and somebody's always got some problem, and and, there, and then you're sitting there forever, and they're about to take off, and whatever, and then the flight attendant stands up and shows you how to put on a seat belt. And, 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 and I was always sitting there thinking, I know how to put on a seat belt, one, and number two, if we crash, that thing isn't gonna help me at all. What do I need it for? All right. Uh, but every time I fly, I get a little bored with the flight attendants before we take off, going over all the safety precautions, because I've heard it all before. And they, of course, they make you, uh, the last time, I think when we flew to Bolivia, uh, was it me and you, Britt? We had our earbuds in. We're like, man, this is great. Uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna ignore the rest of the world and this this won't be so bad and they come by and say take those out of your ears what you got to listen to us tell you how to put on a seatbelt and uh, and so they make sure that we understand and I'm always sitting there thinking to myself well duh I know how to do this why do we have to talk about this again and this morning uh, I'm gonna talk about a subject that might make you think uh, well duh. <laughs> Why do we have to talk about this again? Um, my subject today is simply this. Jesus is the best. Period. End of story. Now that can't be the end of the story because I've just started preaching and if that's the end of the story then I'm going to wrap it up and preach the world's shortest sermon. And I have a reputation to maintain so I can't do that. That will knock down my average. And so... Uh, a, a, a man can't just make one statement without further comment, pray, and then dismiss the congregation. Can he? Some of you guys are like, try it, try it, yeah. If I did that now, you'd get home, the roast would be half-baked, and you'd have to smell it and, uh, and not be able to eat it. It would be torture, so here we go. But here's my statement. Jesus is the best. Now, what do you say to that? You say, well, duh. We know this. We're convinced. Why do we have to talk about this again? I mean, not that you're offended by the subject, but you've heard it all before, right? Well, I mean, we're convinced. Jesus is best. Why then must we talk about it? We must talk about it because even though we believe he's the best, even though we're convinced of that, we often be become distracted from that truth. It's pretty easy to become distracted from something you know to be true, right? You know that you're supposed to use your blinker when you switch lanes. Do you always do it? If anybody says no, then I'm going to be mad at you. You're one of those people, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you, know, you know certain things, but you're distracted from them. And, and we become distracted from the truth that Jesus is best sometimes and when we do that we begin to live our lives as if we really do not believe it there's practical implications other things begin to take the place in our lives that only Christ deserves what kind of things take the place of Christ in, in the life of a Christian well, sin yeah evil sometimes bad things yes certainly but, but we've talked about those many times. There, are, uh, there is a more subtle distraction that God points out to us today, and it is this. What kind of things distract us from Christ and take the priority that only belongs to Him? Sometimes it's good things. Good things distract us from Christ. Things that are not evil, things that are not in and of themselves sinful. Uh, the danger of good things is their subtlety. Good things do not make us feel guilty like bad things do. Good things give us good feelings, feelings of accomplishment, feelings of goodness, feelings of joy even. But when good things take the place in our lives that should be reserved for Christ alone, then they become bad things. We must 
state then that Christ is best, and we must talk about this because so often we allow what is good to distract us from what is best, and that is Jesus. Did you know that we're not the only Christians here in 21st century America that have struggled with this problem? Uh, in fact, did you know that uh, some of the first century Christians struggled with the same problem? Too? Some of the first Christians struggled with it. And let us look at a passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 1 that describes the struggle for us. And, and it relates the story to us this way. It shows us that others, even people in the first generation after Christ, uh, others became distracted from the glory of Christ by something good. And it showed them, this passage showed them what they must do to avoid this distraction and to and, and, and it speaks the same truth to us. And so if you're with me in, in Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, beginning in verse 4 through the end of the chapter. All right, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4, speaking of Jesus, it says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth the firstborn into the, or the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all wax old at thus a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now, if you, as we look at that passage of Scripture, did you see what distracted the first century Jews from the glory of Christ? Did you see the good thing that got their eyes off of Christ and onto something else? Who was distracted? First century Christians, Jewish Christians. But what distracted them? Did you see that? Angels. Angels distracted them. Angels are good things. First century Jewish believers allowed angels to distract them from Christ. And, and, and angels are wonderful. Angels are, are, are excellent. I'm glad we have them. Um, and it was not the angels' fault, by the way. They weren't going around saying, look at me. It's not what angels do. Um, but these first century Jewish believers, to whom the book of Hebrews was first written, they allowed angels to distract them from the glory of Christ, from the fact that Christ is best. Notice the structure of this passage. It is an argument. Uh, the, the writer states his proposition right up front. He says in verse 4 that Jesus has been made so much better than the angels. He's, a, he's attacking the, the subject head on. And then for the rest of the passage, he offers one proof after another to support that proposition. He asked some rhetorical questions. He said, did God ever say to any angel, you are my son? Verse 5. Did God ever say to any angel, I will be his father and he will be my son? Um, and then he said, is Jesus better than the angels? God says, well, let all the angels worship him. That'll answer the question. Um, then he asks in verse 13, did God ever say to any angel, you sit here at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet? No, the answer to all those questions is no. God didn't say that to any angel. But he did say that to the son, didn't he? And so it proves that Jesus is best. He's better than any angel. So why go to such great lengths to tell Jewish believers in the first century that Jesus was better than angels? I'm sure they understood that. But 
It was because although angels are good, they had distracted these early believers from Christ. That's the purpose of this argument. What did first century Jews believe about angels anyway? Did they think about them the same way we think about them? Precious moments. You know, the little teardrop-faced angels. Uh, or, or uh, God forbid, if we think about it like TV shows, touched by an angel. Um, or uh, what was the one with Michael Landon in it? Um, Highway to Heaven, right? Um, I've never watched one of those episodes, but that's, he's supposed to be an angel in that, right? Um, and in all of these, you see the, the movie angels are really, I hope, not how you view angels. Um, it's really a bad idea to get your theology from a television set anyway. Just, just keep that in mind. But uh, what did first century Jews believe about angels? Well, because of Talmudic writings and popular rabbinical interpretations and ideas, uh, the Jewish people at the time that this, this epistle was written, they had begun to embellish basic Old Testament teachings about angels. They had, they had uh, played it up a little bit. The, the backdrop of this epistle includes some common Jewish misconceptions. Now, they believed many things that were correct about angels, but many things were exaggerated. Um, Jews at that time esteemed angels to be the highest beings next to God. They also believed that angels were the instruments of God in bringing his word to, to men uh, and in working his will in the universe. Those things are maybe correct. I'm, I haven't really studied angels out to the fullest extent, so I'm, uh, uh, but some of these things get a little hairy. <laughs> angels were thought to be uh, ethereal creatures made of some fiery substance like blazing light and and they would not eat or drink or procreate or anything like that many Jews believe that angels this is where it gets a little weird they believed sometimes that angels acted as God's Senate or council and that he didn't do anything without first consult consulting them um, there was some idea of Genesis 126 where God says let us make man in our image and it's like and, and the idea is he's talking to the angels in his senate and council and he's counseling with them whether or not he should create man um, and uh, of course according to some some Jewish tradition at the time some of the angels in that senate had objected to this and had been immediately annihilated. I guess if you're in God's senate, you better just say yes to whatever he says, right? Um, and then they believe that some other angels had, had objected to the giving of the law to Moses. And when Moses was going up, on, up his way to Mount Sinai, they had attacked him on the way because they didn't want him to get the law of Moses. Why would I don't understand how angels would want to do that but uh, and that wasn't every Jewish person that believed that but there were that that was out there many times uh, or many names for angels were coined um, angels that were called presence angels supposedly never left the presence of God uh, God's throne some of them were named Raphael or Uriel or Fanuel or Gabriel or Michael those were biblical names there uh, Jews believed that 200 angels controlled the movements of the stars. So they're out there pushing the stars around, I guess, or something. Um, they believed in a calendar angel controlling the never-ending succession of days and months and years. A mighty, mighty angel took care of the seas while others superintended the frost, the dew, the rain, the snow, the hail, the thunder, and the lightning. Still other angels were considered wardens of hell and torturers of the damned. There were even recording angels who wrote down every word that you speak. There was an angel of death, and on the other hand, guardian angels for every nation and every child. Angels were believed to be so numerous that one rabbi claimed that every blade of grass had its own angel. Many Jews believed that the old covenant was brought to them from God by angels. If you look at Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, he alludes to that fact. Um, and they believed angels were the mediators of their covenant with God and that angels continually ministered God's blessings to them. 
And, uh, and the old covenant was brought to man and maintained by angelic mediation. And the Jews knew this. And, they, and consequently, they had a really high regard for angels. Some actually worshipped angels. Maybe not as God, but as something deified. And uh, we, when you read through the book of Galatians and, and uh, Colossians, you see the idea that in the background is Gnosticism, the early uh, belief and early heresy that involved, among other things, the worship of angels. It's even, they, they even in Gnosticism reduced Jesus Christ to being one of the angels. Listen to how Paul addresses that in, in Colossians chapter 2. He says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. And so he, uh, he, he addresses that head on. That was something going on. And early believers were being tempted to do that. So to the Jewish mind, angels were extremely exalted and immeasurably important. A Jewish person who was not a believer but who was considering Jesus Christ and had heard the gospel, they would need to hear this message to hear that he was so much better than the angels. On the other hand, a Jewish believer, someone who had already put his faith and trust in Christ, and but he had maybe had been influenced by his background and culture to give glory to angels that was not due to them but only due to Christ. This maybe young baby Christian who was Jewish, he definitely needed to read this argument. And so when, uh, the, when uh, first century Jewish believers became distracted by angels, what did God do to help them? What did God do to point their eyes in the right direction? What was the remedy? The Holy Spirit under uh, uh, through the writer of the epistle here to the Hebrews, the Holy Spirit told them not to allow the greatness of angels to distract them from the glory of Christ. He's going to point to the glory of Christ and get their eyes where they need to be. Not that angels are bad. The Holy Spirit just pointed out that Jesus is better. Jesus is best. And being so much better, Jesus deserved preeminence in their worship and priority in their life. And how did the Holy Spirit correct them this way? How did God tell them to stop being distracted by angels and to give all the glory to Jesus? What does He do? Well, the Holy Spirit inspires the author of Hebrews here to highlight four ways in which Christ is better than the angels. Four ways in which Christ is the best. And I want to look at those in our text here this morning. And the first way that Christ is better than the angels, the first way that Christ is best is this. Christ is best by title. He's best by title. And we don't put a lot of stock in titles these days. We fought in 1776 a nice little war to get away from things like titles and nobility, right? We, we don't put much stock in title. But Jesus Christ is best by title. Uh, it says in verse 4 of Christ, it is, is speaking this, being made so much better than the angels as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I want you to notice that Jesus has a better title than any angel. This is stated when it says uh, that he has obtained a more excellent name than they. To us, a name is just a name, right? It's what we call each other. In ancient culture all over the world really but even in, especially in Israel a name was more than just a name it was it was a person's identity it was their title and so it says of Jesus he has obtained a more excellent name than they and I want you to look closely it says that Jesus obtained that name he obtained this more excellent name now wait a second why did Jesus have to obtain that name I mean, being eternal, God, didn't Jesus already have a more excellent name than angels? If you already have something, do you have to obtain it? Well, no. Well, 
Why did Jesus have to obtain it? And how did Jesus obtain a more excellent name than the angels? That question is answered by two phrases. One is this, being made. And the second phrase is this day. Being made and, and uh, this day is found in verse 5. Being made. Was Jesus created? No. He's eternal God. He's the second person of the Godhead. There's no way Jesus was created. In fact, we've already seen in the book of Hebrews, the first couple of verses, Jesus was the creator. He wasn't created. Then why does it say being made? Well, being made, that phrase translates the Greek participle genomenos. Genomenos does not mean to be created, it means really to become. As, as a participle in the aorist tense, it's saying that Jesus having become, having become so much better than the angels. He was not created, but he became better than the angels in one aspect. But wasn't Jesus already better than the angels? Well, yes. But there was a time in which Jesus became a little lower than the angels. And, and it happened in a specific point in time on a, on a particular day. And we celebrate that day every December 25th. That time was when Jesus became human. That, that brings us to this second phrase I mentioned. And, and that is the phrase this day in verse 5. And God asks two rhetorical questions here. He says, to which angel did I ever say, this day have I begotten thee? And obviously the answer is to none, but he could say that to Jesus. And of which angel did I ever say, says God, which angel did I ever say this of? I am his father and he is my son. The answer to that is none, but he says that of Jesus. Jesus is the eternal second person of the Godhead. He is God of all eternity. But the phrase this day in verse 5, it's very important. It does not describe eternity. It, ex it describes a singular point in time. Why is that significant? Well, it means that there was a singular point in time that God said of Jesus, this is my son and I have begotten him. Um, we are speaking strictly of the physical world. Jesus obviously existed from eternity past. He is the ever existing God. But there was a day that he came into this world in physical flesh. And he became a man without ceasing to be God. That is the day that he was begotten of the Father. That was the day that God said, I will be his Father and he will be my Son. And God never said that of any angel. And Jesus was made, according to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, he was made a little lower than the angels. Look at that. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless and holy life. And then he died and then he arose the third day from the grave. In all that time, Jesus was living a little lower than the angels, at least from a human perspective. But then what happened? Well, look at back in chapter 1, verse 3. Look at the second half of that verse. When he had by himself purged our sins, what did he do? He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus, after rising from the dead, ascended up into heaven and took his exalted place in his exalted title as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, sitting at the right hand of the power and the majesty on high. He, at his ascension, Jesus, here it is, at his ascension, Jesus obtained a more excellent name than all the angels. He had been made a little lower than the angels and then rose from the grave and ascended into heaven and going back to his place uh, in his throne. Christ is the best by this title he obtained. He had that title in eternity. 
He earned that title in time. Jesus is best. That's the first, that's the first um, argument, the first aspect in which Jesus is better than the angels that our passage points. I want you to notice the second one. Jesus is best, not only by title, but Jesus is best by nature. By nature. He's a natural at it. All right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But under the sun, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee above, uh, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. I want you to notice the term first begotten. First begotten. Speaking of Jesus, God said when he bringeth his first begotten into the world. Does this term first begotten mean that Jesus is just the first of all God's created beings? Some people try to teach that from this passage of scripture. But the answer to that question is no. Um, Jesus is eternal God. In many, but, but then how can he be the first begotten here? Well, in, in Mideastern culture, and in Jewish culture too, and especially that of biblical times, the firstborn refers to rank, not order. In other words, it doesn't mean that you were born first necessarily. It means that you are most important. You were the chief one uh, among everyone else or above everyone else. Um, and so it's not a chronological thing. The firstborn of rank did not always have to be the first person born in the family, although that was usually the case. But think about Jacob and Esau. Esau was born first, and then Jacob said, I'll give you a bowl of soup for your birthright. That seems like a bad deal right there. I hope that was good soup. Uh, and, and Esau consented and sold his birthright. And, and, and what happened? All of a sudden, Jacob now is the firstborn, even though he was born second. He was the chief one, and he got the blessing. And God honored that. Jesus being the firstborn simply means that he is, he is the, uh, of the highest rank. And, it is, and he is that by nature because he is God. Um, and and it, says, uh, it said back here in verse 5 that, um, I'm sorry, verse 4, he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. That's his, that's his rank by right. He's, he's the firstborn, the chief one. No angel has such a high nature. Lucifer tried to obtain firstborn status, but he failed. Notice the contrast that the Holy Spirit makes between the nature of Christ and the nature of angels here in this passage. God calls Jesus God. He's quoting from the Psalms. And... And God calls Jesus God, thy throne, O God. This is God talking to Jesus. <clears throat> but he calls the angels his ministers, his servants. Uh, look at uh, verse 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Minister simply means servant. And then he commands the angels to worship Christ. Worship is something that's reserved only for God. Christ is by nature God. And then notice the excellent quality of Jesus' nature as pointed out here in our passage in verse 9. He says that Jesus is a lover of righteousness. He says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Jesus is a lover of righteousness. Consequently, in loving righteousness, Jesus hates sin, iniquity, lawlessness. If we're to be like Christ, by the way, that's how we are to be in our nature. This is the, one of the best things about Jesus' nature. Christ is by nature the chief one of all the world, first begotten, said here. The one who the angels adore and worship. By nature, Jesus is the master of the angels. By nature, he is God of very God. By nature, he loves righteousness and hates iniquity. 
by nature, look at verse 9 again, the end of the verse, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He is anointed above all the angels. The word fellows refers to angels here because angels are the ones being discussed that Jesus is better than. And, and Jesus is anointed. That's very important, by the way. The word Christ is the Greek term for Messiah, which is the Hebrew term for anointed one. Christ simply means anointed one. And Jesus is the one that God anointed above all the angels. Why? Because it's his inheritance. He's an heir to that title. It is his nature. He is, he is God, a very God. Christ is best, not only by title, but it's not an undeserved title. It, he is best by nature. And then look at the third thing that the author points out here. Christ is best by existence. Verse 10, And thou, O Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Jesus has a superior existence to all creation and even the angels because unlike angels, he has an eternal existence. There was a time when there were no angels. There was never a time when there was no Jesus. He is eternal in his existence, but also Jesus is unchanging in his existence. Look what it says here. It says that Jesus someday is going to fold up the universe like, a, like an old vest. But he will never change. He'll remain the same. Hebrews 13, 8, later on in this epistle, says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ is better than the angels by existence, it's pointed out. And then fourthly, our passage points out that Christ is better, not only by title, by nature, and by existence. Christ is better by purpose. He's better in his purpose than than the angels. Verse 13, But unto which of the angels said he at any time, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? Look at this. In this passage, in, in, in these verses, Jesus is king. He, his purpose is to rule. The rhetorical question is this. What angel did God ever say speak to and say sit at my right hand none until I make your enemies your your stool under your foot none he wouldn't say that to an angel but he says that to Jesus where does a king sit on a throne right and so what is the purpose of a king kings rule that's his purpose his purpose is he is sovereign. He is in control. He rules. This is the place of power on the right hand of majesty on high. He is a righteous king over a righteous kingdom. In verse 8, Jesus' purpose is to rule and to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. But what are the angels in this contrast? He says the angels have a purpose in verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them that shall be the heirs of salvation? What are angels? They are servants. Servants to the Lord. And Jesus even sends them forth to minister to us. When Jesus was tempted of the devil, and after 40 days, what happened? Angels showed up afterwards and they ministered to him. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he sweat great drops of blood, angels showed up and ministered to him. That's what they do. They're ministers. They're servants. Christ though has a better purpose. As good as the purpose of the angels is, Christ's purpose is better. He rules. God told the first century Jewish believers about this. Told them not to let the greatness of angels distract them from the glory of God. How? Well, he simply pointed out these four ways in which Christ is better than the angels. Four ways in which Christ is best. He's better by title. He's better by nature. He's better by existence. 
He's better by purpose. You see, we're not the only Christians who might struggle with allowing good things to distract us from Jesus Christ, are we? We saw what God said to early Jewish believers. But what does God say to us? Here's what God says to us. Don't let what is good distract you from what is best. Jesus Christ. Don't let good things distract you from the best thing. Jesus Christ. There are plenty of good things in life. But they are just that. Good things. Jesus is best. And for believers, we must focus on nothing but the best. No good person holds a better title for you than the title that Jesus Christ holds. He talked about it. Husband, wife, son, daughter, friend. No person holds a better title than the title that Jesus holds. That's how we ought to view life. No person has a better priority. How about this, a celebrity? Many people are led away from their love for Christ by following the opinions of someone they admire or someone who has a great following. I imagine if someone today were to publish a book about their encounter, supposed encounter with an angel, Christians would buy that book by the millions. Why? Well, angels are good, but we're so easily distracted from what is best. No good person holds a better title for you than the title that Jesus Christ holds. How about this? No good thing is naturally as good for you as Jesus Christ is good for you. Jesus is good in his very nature. Everything about him is good. There's nothing in this world. Think of the best things you can think of. None of them are good all the way through in their nature in every aspect like Jesus is. No good thing is naturally naturally as good for you as Christ is. How about this? No good thing exists that is better for you than Jesus Christ is. Only Jesus exists eternally. And only Jesus exists is unchanging. That good thing you love now that distracts you from Christ, it might change. And it might become unlovable next week. Or you might change in your preference and not be able to love it next week. I think about when I took economics in high school and we learned about the law of diminishing marginal utility. Basically, that means when you eat a candy bar, the first candy bar tastes great. It's amazing, that first Snickers bar. But if you eat six of them in a row, you will not enjoy the sixth one like you enjoyed the first one. It's Maybe it's better to illustrate it this way. Nobody in here eats six candy bars in a row, right? When I was when I was, uh, my wife and I were first married, I was 170 pounds soaking wet, and I decided to get to 200 pounds. One of the ways I would do that was eat a six pack of full size Snicker bars a day. And I did that for a whole summer. I was, I was working out too, all right, but uh, I just couldn't put on weight. And you know what I, by the end of the summer, I didn't want to see another Snicker bar. I hated them. You guys are like, you eat, candy, you eat candy like that? You have no self-control? That was self-control, I hated them. So I was force feeding myself Snickers bars. All right, I can tell you this, I can tell you from experience. If you work on a loading dock on, on second or third shift, and you eat four Snickers bars throughout that shift, it doesn't matter how long that shift is, you start hating Snickers bars. All right. The thing is, that good thing that you love that distracts you from Christ, you might change somewhere along the way and not love it as much. Then you've been distracted from from Christ by something that doesn't even last. Why? Because you change. Jesus never changes. He is worthy. No good thing has a better existence than Christ. 
No good thing has a better purpose than Jesus Christ. He is king and he rules in righteousness. Consequently, you can absolutely trust that rule. We, like angels, are his servants. How happy are we in that position? Jesus is best. Period. End of story. That's where we began, right? Well, duh. <laughs> we know this. Why do we have to talk about this again? Because we're so often distracted from Christ by things that are good in and of themselves. I haven't really mentioned anything specifically, and I've done that on purpose because I can't read your mind, but perhaps the Holy Spirit is putting something there. What is it that distracts you from Christ? Don't let what is good distract you from what is bad. Nothing but the best for us. Let's stand together.